Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gaunt and I want to thank you for joining with me today. Today being the first Sunday in November, we will, after the message, be celebrating communion together. So if you'd like to grab a piece of bread or a cracker or something that we can share and also something to drink as well. Feel free to go gather that now or just to gather it towards the end of the message so we can join in communion together. Today we come to continue our series in the book of Amos and it'll be part two in Amos chapter five. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there. As you do that, let us just pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for what Jesus has done. We thank you that we know we can love and trust you, that you are a God who keeps all your promises. And we look forward to hearing about them today and being challenged by your word. So, Father, through your spirit, help us today open our ears, open our minds to what you want us to understand. Amen. Amos chapter 5. I'm going to be looking at the last half of the book, verse 18 through to verse 27. Now I wonder, have you ever wished for something? And if you have, I think most of us probably have, have you ever wished for something, then you actually got it, but was it what you expected? Or was it not what you actually expected? I remember one of these times in my life, very clearly that it was like this. When I was growing up, I lived with my nanny. And uh, one of the things that would be a treat is that we would go into the local town and they had this fantastic bakery. And I would have an opportunity. I could either get a custard tart or a ninish tart. You know, the ninish tarts are the, the, the little tarts that have the two colored icing on top, the fake cream inside, and maybe some jam that as well in the bottom. Well. I used to like the Nenish tarts and I loved the Nenish tarts from that bakery. Now, after a number of years, I went to live somewhere different. And so I didn't actually have any Nenish tarts and I liked them in my memory, but it was years and I started to forget about them. And then one day, not too long ago, 10 years or so, I walked down the main street of where I was living and the bakery had Nenish tarts and I saw them and I longed for it. I remembered that experience of having them with my Nana and I wished you know, that I could taste that joy again. Now at that time I was running to a meeting so I couldn't stop and eat but I went back late. I kept thinking about it. I went back and looked in the window. They were still there fresh Nenish tarts and I bought one and I took it out of its packet and that out of that bag and it had that sick, sickly, sweet smell. And I longingly, I'd been wishing for this, took a bite. And my response, yuck! I spat it out straight into the bin that was next to me. I'd wished for this. I had longed for this. I had anticipated what it was going to be. But then it wasn't. I was really disappointed. It was not what I had expected. So has that ever happened to you? You've wished for something. You've got it. But sadly, it wasn't what you expected. Maybe it wasn't with food. Maybe it was something else. You've ordered something online on the internet or you watch some of those TV channels that sell products and you quickly dial the number and when the product turns up, you've been wishing for it. You get it, but it's not what you expected, not at all. Now, I think we have, many of us probably have done that in life. I wonder, though, have we ever done that with God and the promises that God gives us in his word? Now, we've gone through recently the, the book of Revelation. And when we went through that, at the end of it, a couple of people said to me, Stephen, isn't it great that we get to finish the Bible on a positive note? Isn't it great that we get the great promise of heaven? 
And it's true. It's a wonderful thing that we should be looking out for. But he said, Stephen, isn't this something wonderful that we can wish today for heaven? And it is. It is wonderful to wish for heaven. But I wonder, like me with the Nenish hearts, will it actually turn out to be what and like what we expect? Will we actually be ready for heaven? Or will it be nothing like what we expect? I want to ask us the question today, and it's the title of today's message. Do we need to be careful what we are wishing for? Do we need to be careful for what we are wishing for? Because when we come to the second half of Amos today, in Amos chapter 5, I get those sort of thoughts that Israel is asking a similar question here. Let me read to you verse 18. God says through Amos, Why do you long for the day of the Lord? Now the day of the Lord was their way of thinking about um, heaven in a way. It was their way of thinking that God was going to come and free them. But is there more to it than that? Now, on the day of the Lord was that for the Israelites, was the greatest day ever. This is something that every single day they were wishing for, that God would come into the world and that he would punish everyone who was not a Jew, that he would set the Jewish people up as the rulers of the world and everyone who had survived God's judgment would bow down before them. That God would fix every situation, every ill, every trial, every challenge that the Jewish people would face. God would snap his fingers in the day of the Lord and God would fix it. All that the Jewish people needed to do was be Jewish. All they had to do was be born a Jew. All they had to do was occasionally go do sacrifices, give a bit of lip service to God, and the day of the Lord would come. They didn't know when it would come, but it was something they wished for every single day. And you know, what I just talked about there, about safety, about power, about ruling the world and all of that, you can sort of see why it, for them, is a bit about like us as Christians thinking about heaven. In our passage today, in Amos chapter 5, God talks about the day of the Lord. But when he does, you know, these, the Israelites, they're wishing for this. They can't wait for this. They have this picture of what it's going to be. And God's going to give them a different picture. I think they have to be careful what they wish for. Let's have a look. What are they looking for? Because what God, when God responds here in Amos 5, I don't think it is what they expect at all. Verse 18 says this, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Now you would think it's a good thing. You would think Israel looking for the day of the Lord when God would come back and bring salvation and bring peace and set everything right. That would be a good thing to look for. Why do you long, verse 18, for the day of the Lord? They desired the day of the Lord. The Israelites wished for the day of the Lord. But God says that's not the response because it's not going to be what you expect. Like me with the Nenish tarts, I had this image, I had this view. This is what it was going to taste like when I bit into it. Yuck! Spat it out. Not what I wanted not what I expected. And God wants to make it clear here, the Israelites have their own view of what the day of the Lord is, and God says, no, it's not what you expect. You're wishing for it, yes, great, but it's not going to be what you expect. God says they've got it wrong. Now, remember, peace, power, prosperity, all of that. But what does God say? I love the picture in verse 19 and 20. 
I just love the way he describes it here. He says that they are going to face troubles in the world, face challenges, the Israelites, and then they're going to run away. They're going to escape those troubles. And it's going to be like running away from a lion. But when they run away from a lion, you then run into a bear. Again, challenges, issues, horrible. And then you run away from the bear. You finally reach your house. You reach your destination. You reach your home. In, in terms of what they're talking about, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, you get to the day of the Lord. That's your safety. They enter their house. They lean up against the wall, it says in 19 and 20. And what happens? They get bitten by a snake and die. You really know if you ran away from a lion, ran into a bear, ran away from a bear, got home, thought you were safe, and then got bitten by a snake, you know you've had a really bad day. God says the same thing to them. This day of the Lord that they're wishing for, that they expect, that they have this picture for, it's not going to be that way. They're going to get home and they think it's safety. They think it's going to be all joy and peace and prosperity and power for the Israelites. But God says, no, it's like being bitten, getting through all of that. The day comes and you're going to be bitten by a snake and die. It is not what you expect. You're expecting this heavenly bliss. Actually, judgment is coming. God's wrath is coming. And you, when you hear that, you would think that's the message of Amos. So far. We've seen it over and over again. God says, turn back to me, worship my way, or judgment is coming. Now, remember how they thought about the day of the Lord? All we have to do is be a Jew. Born a Jew, we're okay with God. Bit of lip service, a couple of sacrifices, a couple of religious festivals in a year, we're okay with God. Therefore, the day of the Lord, power, prosperity, peace, that's ours. God says no. Instead, judgment is coming. Wrath is coming. Why? Because they're not living the way God wants. They're doing it their way. And we've touched on that in the last couple of weeks as well. They were thinking they could escape all their troubles with the day of the Lord. But God says, actually, the greatest trouble is going to come. Judgment and wrath from God. And this follows on the second half of chapter 5 from the first half. Remember last week we had the poem of lament where Ahimos gave their eulogy while they were still alive. He says to the Israelites, this is your funeral service. Get ready. This is what's going to happen. Judgment, wrath, God is coming. Certainty. He talked about it in the past tense. It is coming. The whole warning and the challenge, therefore turn around and follow God his way. But they didn't want to listen. Again here, they're longing for the day of the Lord. But what they were expecting is not what they were going to get. What they were expecting was their own view, man-made view, of what the end would look like. And they would come out rosy. But that's not what God says is going to happen. Now I wonder at times whether we can fall in a way for the same trap. And maybe we... Think of heaven, paradise, as peace, as an escape, as the, you know, the challenges and the issues we face here in the world, maybe health issues, financial issues, relationship issues, um, job issues, whatever it might be. Maybe we look at heaven as being an escape from all those issues. And so we, like the Israelites, are wishing for heaven. We're wishing for Jesus to come back. That beautiful picture we looked at at the end of the book of Revelation. No more pain, no more tears, no more suffering, no more death. Awesome picture. That is what we want, isn't it? It is. But remember the, the challenge of it? It is only there for those who are saved. It is only there for those who follow Jesus. 
There are a lot of people, I think, that are looking forward to their version of heaven in our world. That when they die, they're looking for this peace, this pros maybe prosperity. They're looking for a situation that is better than what they face now. Maybe they think because their parents were Christian or went to church, then they're okay. Maybe they think God is just a good bloke and everyone will have God's love and everyone will be in heaven. Now, the old Aussie uh, slang, it'll be all right, mate. Maybe a lot of people start to think that God's going to treat them like that. Is that how people are going to experience and expect and have this anticipation of heaven? Well, God would say it's wrong. There's only one way, and that's by believing and following Jesus. It's only in what he has done that we get to see heaven. When we think about heaven, I talked about this at the beginning of this message. We do wish for it. We do look for it. We long for it. But remember, it is only there for those who love and follow Jesus. So the day that Jesus returns, or if he, we die before he returns, then two things can happen. We either get to go in heaven because we love and follow Jesus, or if we don't and haven't made that choice, we can't do it later after we've died, we then will face judgment and wrath because we haven't been living God's way. We haven't worshipped him. We haven't followed him the way he wants and that is exactly what happens with the Israelites. The message is exactly the same. They're looking for their view of the day of the Lord. And it's a good view if you follow God on his terms. But if you don't, Amos says you're going to face judgment and God's wrath. Your day of the Lord is not actually going to be what you expect. The same for us. If we don't love and follow Jesus, if we don't do things God's way, then this thought of heaven, this expectation, this wish, it's not going to be what we expect. And the same message for in Amos is the same message we need to hear. If we're not right with God, then we will at the end face judgment and his wrath. That's why the Israelites need to be careful what they wish for. They're wishing for this day of the Lord. Come tomorrow, they want. They would all die. They would all face God's judgment and wrath. We too need to think about that. They were not ready. Will we be ready? And were the Israelites supposed to have feast days? Yes. Were they supposed to gather in what they called solemn assemblies? Yes. Were they supposed to give burnt offerings and peace offerings and meat offerings and all of those? The answer is yes. But what's the problem then? If they seem to do this outward service at different times, aren't they doing what God wants? No, they weren't doing what God wants because their hearts weren't in it. They truly weren't doing it God's way. And worshipping God for who he is and what he'd done for them. They just wanted to worship God their way. They had this false sense of security. And what God tells them here at the end of chapter 5, very bluntly, is that he dislikes their form of worship. Remember, they thought to be right with God, be born a Jew, do a couple of the sacrifices, do a couple of the religious festivals, and then that's it. You're okay with God. They couldn't wait for the day of the Lord because they were okay. But they weren't really ready, were they? God says to them, I don't like your worship. You're not ready for the day of the Lord. What do you expect? You expect peace, power, prosperity. You're not going to get it. What you are going to get is judgment, wrath. That's what they faced. They weren't ready. Will we? 
And we need to be careful. And I think we need to reflect on this today and ask God's spirit to challenge us to see whether we truly are walking with him because we might think we're okay, just like they did. For whatever reason, we might think we're okay with God. But then God would say, no, you're not actually ready. You're not okay with me. You're not in a relationship with my son, Jesus. So today, I pray that you will reflect on that and consider whether you truly walk with him or not. Turning up on a Sunday, great for church. But just turning up doesn't mean we're saved. You're worshipping God in different ways. Great. But it doesn't actually mean we're worshipping him truly the way he wants. If our heart is not in it. And sometimes when it comes to worship, and I'm sure it was like this for the Israelites, you ask them the question, do they like worshipping in a certain way? They would tell you, yes, we like doing this. But that's not the question we need to ask. The question we need to ask is, would God find our worship acceptable? Would he be happy with it? The Israelites, the answer was no. What about us? Would he be happy with our forms of worship? It's a good challenge for us to think about. The challenge he gave them is a challenge that we need to hear. Now, I'm sure when Amos gave this message, the Israelites probably sat back and thought, we're Jewish. We're okay. Not a problem. But what does God say in these final verses? Because I think if the challenge is, he wants them again. He comes back to it and says, well, you're not ready. And then they put up their hand and say, yes, we are. So he asks it again. Are you really, really ready? Look at verse 25. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? What's the answer to that question? Now, in verse 25, it's a rhetorical question. Now, he's talking to them about the good old days when they were wandering in the desert. He takes them back to the wilderness. And he says, you know, did you do the sacrifices? How did you do them? Were they part of your worship for me? It's a, it's a good question to ask. And he you know, sometimes you might see older folks sitting around talking about the good old days. That's basically what God is asking. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness people of Israel? Think right back, he's saying it's a long time. But did you do this? Do you remember the good old days? Do you remember that when you were there doing the sacrifices and following me in the wilderness and doing all these things, I provided food, I provided water, I provided perfection, protection? Do you remember? All these great things that we did together and your great response. Well, there's an answer to this question. I wonder what your question was. Answer was, did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness people of Israel? The rhetorical answer, God knows the answer to this question. And the answer is no. They did not. And he's asking them, are you really, really ready for the day of the Lord? Well, they're not. They're saying, hey, look, God, look how good we are. Born a Jew, do this, do that, we're good. God takes them back to their glory days. He takes them back to the good old days. And says, well, actually, he didn't do it back then. And you haven't done it since. He really explains to them. From the moment he chose them. From the moment he brought them out of Egypt. From the moment he told them how to worship him on Mount Sinai. And Moses was, they begged for the law. They begged for God to give them instruction. God gave them the Ten Commandments. When Moses was up on that mountain, when he came down that mountain, because the people had asked to be given all this instruction, what were the people doing down below? They were worshipping idols. 
Moses hadn't even got off the mount. And they were already disobeying God. And then he throws down the Ten Commandments and they're broken. And they get redone. But the thought is right from the very beginning. They begged for instruction. They begged on how to worship God. God answered. And immediately they turned their back on him and started to worship idols. Were they really, really, really in the day of Amos ready to, for the day of the Lord? No. They thought they were okay with God. No. They'd been wrong since the beginning when God had chosen them. Like me with my nanish tarts, I was ready. After all these years, I was ready for them. I had this picture in my mind how they would taste, how good they were. And when I sunk my teeth into them, I quickly realized I was living in the past. And maybe, actually, they weren't that good back then. The same for the Israelites. They'd say, God, we're okay in the time of Amos because we've always followed you correctly. And God says, uh, let's go back to the beginning. And no, you didn't. Right from the very beginning. Calling on the past, living in the past. Hey, it's not going to benefit you because you still failed me back then, says God. Instead of repenting of their sin, instead of turning away in the day of Amos and starting to worship God correctly, they didn't heed the warning. God says to them, you're expecting, you're wishing for the day of the Lord. But it's not what you expect. You're not ready for it. And all that is going to come is judgment and wrath. And as we know, we've talked about it, uh, throughout each week in this series, we know it happens. In 722 BC, when the Assyrians come in and wipe them out. But we need to think about this for ourselves today. Not just whether we truly follow God or not. Not just whether we truly worshipping him his way or not. But as we wish for heaven, as we look for that peace, that security, no more pain, no more suffering, we need to realise that our neighbours, our schoolmates, our workmates, our family, people in our community, if they don't know Jesus, if they don't follow him, that picture that we're looking forward to, that's not going to be the picture for them. So part of the challenge is when we understand what Amos is talking about is to realise we need to be right with God first. That's number one. But two, we need to share about Jesus with people so that they can have an opportunity to respond. Do we do that? Do we take that opportunity? Will we be ready to face God? Will they be ready to face God? As we come to close, I want to share with you a funny story. It's about a guy who forgot his anniversary and his wife was really, really unhappy that he'd forgot. And so when he came home from work and he had forgotten, she said through clenched teeth, she told him, the only way that you can fix this is that when I wake up in the morning, I want a present sitting out in that driveway that can go from naught to a hundred in three seconds. And then she stormed off to bed. Well, when she woke up in the morning, her husband had gone off to work and she looked out the window. And there was a little box, all wrapped up nicely in the driveway. And so she put on a dressing gown. She raced out. She got to the box. She tore open the wrapping paper. And do you know what the present was? A brand new bathroom scale. Well, the funeral for her husband was held three days later. The gift wasn't what she expected, was it? She wanted something to go from 0 to 100 in three seconds. She wanted a sports car. What she got was a pair, uh, a set of bathroom scales. 
But it's interesting when we think about it, we can laugh at that. But in reality, didn't she get what she asked for? She got something that would go from naught to a hundred in a hurry because she was overweight and everything else. What are we actually wishing for? When we think about God and his promises, what are we wishing for? Because God will give us the true answer to what he's promised. He'll give us what he expects. But is it actually what we expect as well? Does our expectations, whether it's heaven or something else, do our expectations actually match up to his? We need to be careful, like the Israelites, what we wish for. Because God will always give us what we deserve and need in this case to fulfill his promises. For the Israelites, they had to turn back to God, but they chose not to. Today, if we don't love and follow Jesus, then we too will face wrath and God's judgment. Which is waiting for us today? Were the Israelites really ready to face the day of the Lord and face God? No! Are we? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask now in the quietness that your spirit challenges us, that your spirit opens our heart and our mind. Lord, show us whether we truly have this relationship with you or not. Lord, we want to be ready to meet you one day, whenever that will be. Lord, if we love and follow Jesus, we look forward to that day. But we also realise the responsibility the challenge that comes with it, that we need to share that great news with others. So Lord, help us to do that this week in your name. Amen. We're going to celebrate now, which I think fits well in that message this morning, communion together. So if you'd like to grab something to eat and something to drink, we'll do that together. I want to share as we gather around the Lord's table. It is a table of remembrance. So we can remember all that God has done for us. And we can remember the truths in the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament. But mostly we need to remember what Jesus has done. We need to realize that from the moment we are born, we are sinners. We have this broken relationship with God and we cannot fix the problem ourselves. But God says, I will fix it for you. Here is my son. When he dies on that cross, I'm offering you grace. I'm offering you mercy. All you have to do is love and follow him. And therefore the judgment and wrath that we deserve for disobeying God, we won't face it because it fell on Jesus. But again, it's only for those who love and follow him. So when we come around this table of celebration and remembrance and thanksgiving today, if you love Jesus, then participate with us. Because we remember what he has done. So when we wish for and we have this expectation of heaven, it's okay and it matches what God wants. Because Jesus did it for us. So it's not in our own efforts. Our own efforts will lead us away from God. But Jesus did it for us. So my prayer for you is that you've made the choice to love and follow him. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 11, he said this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you've got a piece of bread or something to eat, Jesus on the night before he went to the cross, he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples like he had done many times. And then he says, I'm going to reinterpret it. This piece of bread, it reminds us symbolically of what my body is going to do tomorrow. On that cross, I'm going to become the sacrifice.
sacrifice. My body will be broken for you, for your forgiveness, said Jesus. Let's remember what he's done for us. If you love Jesus, let's take and eat. The Apostle Paul then continues to the church at Corinth. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, he took the wine and symbolically said, this reminds us that my blood will be shed. In the Old Testament, for the forgiveness of sins, blood had to be shed. Jesus said, tomorrow it's going to be my blood. Remember for all time what I've done for you as I died on that cross. Now he doesn't tell them here, he told them earlier that three days later he would be resurrected. But they didn't get that either. We know the full story. When he was resurrected, three days later, he conquered sin, he conquered death. And he gives us that beautiful picture that if we love and follow him, one day we too will have new bodies. So as one family with God as our head, looking forward to that day of new bodies, let us drink together. Father, we just want to say thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we are forgiven. When we could not help ourselves, you did it for us. Help us never to take that for granted. And help us to use that knowledge to spur us on to share Jesus with others. We pray for this now in your name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you. For joining with me today. Next week we will continue our series on the book of Amos. God bless to you and your family and I'll see you next week.